Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's five o'clock and so we're going to start. Uh, welcome to this joint uh, Landmark Chambers and Herbert Smith Three Hills webinar. My name is Neil Cameron. I'm going to chair today's uh, discussion and webinar. And I'm joined by George Carnworth, uh, Matthew White, Annika Holden and Zach Simons and I will introduce all the panellists uh, formally in a moment. But first of all I've got a few of the inevitable housekeeping points. Uh, your microphones are automatically muted so you don't need to adjust your settings uh, and you won't be overheard making comments. We very much welcome questions throughout the session please use the Q&A uh, function to ask any questions you have and ask them uh, when, uh, they, when you'd like to throughout the session. You'll find the Q&A button uh, either down at the bottom or at the top of your screen. We will try and answer uh, as many questions as possible and we're going to do that at the end of the presentation, but I doubt we'll be able to answer them all. The webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link uh, to the recording uh, at the end of the session. And if, hopefully it won't, but if you lose your connection, just rejoin uh, using the link that you joined uh, with originally. So those are all the housekeeping points. So section 73, it was introduced or its predecessor was introduced uh, by section 49 in the Housing and Planning Act 1986 and it came under the heading minor and consequential amendments to deal with a number of matters including applications to vary or revoke conditions attached to planning permission. Well it may be that the answer is it wasn't a minor change and it may be it wasn't even a provision relating to variation of conditions. We have an array of expert panellists to guide us. We are extremely fortunate to be joined by Lord Carnworth, the leading uh, planning judge of his generation and the judge who gave the judgment on the leading case on today's subject, the Lambeth case. So we're going to hear from him, but before we hear from Lord Carnworth, we're going to hear from practitioners, starting with uh, Zach Simons, who is one of the most highly rated junior planning barristers in the country. His practice uh, focuses on a very wide range of planning issues. Uh, you name it, he does it, and he does it at a high level. Uh, and that's at inquiries, and in the whole range of courts. We will then hear from Annika Holden, who's a senior associate in the London planning team at Herbert Smith Freehills. And her experience includes a number of multi-phase regeneration projects, including Tottenham Hale Centre and Deptford Wharves. And no doubt those type of projects raise all sorts of issues with section 73. And she not only acts for developers, but for funders and uh, those seeking to acquire development projects. And then we'll hear from Matthew White. He's a partner in Herbert Smith Freehills in the real estate team, head of planning in London. He's advised on many high profile projects, including Stratford City, Hinkley Point C, BBC Television Centre, Canada Water Master Plan. So very different types of project. And he appears in the Legal 500 Hall of Fame and is identified as a star individual for planning law in London in Chambers and Partners 2021 directory. So we have a panelist with a very wide range of experience and different perspectives. And I'll now turn to Zach Simons uh, to start. Thanks very much, Neil. Good, e good evening, everyone. 
So, uh, to start at the very beginning and to lay the table for what's to come this evening, a quick canter for you through two really important legal powers in the Town and Country Planning Act that we'll be discussing. And here's the real rub. One of them amends planning permissions and the other one doesn't. So the one which amends planning permissions is section 96A, and conceptually anyway, this is the easier one. You're applying to vary an existing planning permission, any bit of it, conditions, description of development, and the local planning authority can grant the application so long as the change is not material. What does material mean? Well, of course, the statute doesn't tell us. The planning practice guidance doesn't help too much either. It just says it'll depend on the context of the overall scheme which means in the end, whether a change is material or not amounts to a case by case judgment call for each local planning authority. Now, if the local planning authority disagrees with you on whether a change would be material, there's no route of appeal to the planning inspectorate. In theory, the decision is amenable to judicial review, but 99 times out of 100, that's going to be a fruitless exercise because the court's likely to afford councils a very wide berth indeed in deciding what material means, which means in reality, your next stop's likely to be an application under Section 73. So, Section 73 applications. What do we think we know? The planning practice guidance talks about minor material amendments. We'll strike that bit from your minds immediately because Section 73 applications don't amend anything and lots of the problems which have troubled the courts in Section 73 cases, which we'll come on to, come from this frequent talk of amending and varying and more of that anon. So if you're not amending or, or varying an earlier permission, what exactly are you doing? The statute calls it an application to develop land without compliance with conditions previously attached. Technically, it's a brand new planning application. And if you succeed, you end up with a brand new planning permission. Same description of development, we'll come back to that, but different conditions attached, which could put you in the happy position of having two permissions covering a single site. And you may be able to elect which of those to implement, which can lead to its own problems. More on that in a future webinar, I suspect. Um, if a section 73 application amounts to a fresh application, Anyway, why not just make a full planning application? Well, there are some legal reasons for choosing Section 73, and there are some practical reasons. And I'll cover a couple of the legal reasons, and I think Annika may be coming back to how it works on the ground uh, in a few minutes' time. Now, the first point is the scope of Section 73. And under subsection 2 of Section 73, the Council considers only the question of the conditions subject to which the planning permission should be granted, the court tells us in cases like PI that this is a more limited exercise than the original decision on whether to grant permission. How much more limited? That depends. It depends on the nature and scope of the conditions that you're seeking to vary. So what can Section 73 applications really do and what can't they do? Well, 20 years ago, Mr Justice Sullivan, as he then was, told us in the Arrowcroft case that the council is able to impose different conditions on a new planning permission, but only if they're conditions which the council could lawfully have imposed on the original planning permission, in the sense that, and here's the key phrase from Arrowcroft, they don't amount to a fundamental alteration of the proposal put forward in the original application. The real key is, is that the new conditions on a section 73 permission can't derogate from the operative words of the original description of development. If you want to vary the description of the development, you need to do one of two things. You need a new planning application, or if the variation isn't material, I'll come back to that in a moment, you need an application under 96A. Let's take an example from recent years that have troubled the courts. Um, planning permission granted for wind turbines with a tip height of 100 metres. That height is specified in the description of development. Now, that the developer applies for a section 73 consent to move the height up to 125 metres. Now, the Court of Appeal told us in Finney in November of 2009 that that cannot be done. And in a nutshell, the Planning Authority can't use Section 73 to change the description of development. And it may be that Lord Carnworth wants to say something about that outcome later on this evening. But it's worth noting right at the outset that there is one way around this Finney problem. In a case where the relevant parameter wind turbine height in Finney, but it could be 
number of dwellings, amount of floor space, range of use classes or what, whatever it is in the description development. In a case where that parameter is set both in the description of development and in conditions, which is the norm, you can often amend the description of development under 96A by removing the reference to turbine height, number of dwellings, whatever it might be. That won't be a material change because the height is still controlled by condition. The number of units is still controlled in the conditions. That change of description of development having been in the bag, you can then potentially proceed under section 73, unwieldy, costly, and maybe a bit slow, but often it just about works. A more recent example of this problem was the 15th of January of this year, Parkview Homes decision of David Elvin QC in the High Court. Now that case was about a music venue in Chichester called the Vestry. The original planning permission allowed A3 use, food and drink. A section 73 was granted in the context of possible enforcement action, which didn't change that description of development, A3 use, but added a new condition stating that the building should be used for A4, pub, food and drink. Well, the, the court found that that can't be done. Applying Finney, the, the condition was inconsistent with the description of development. The section 73 permission grants permission with one hand and the revised condition takes it away with the other. So the permission was quashed. That's the Finney problem. We need to make sure the conditions in our section 73 consent are co consistent with the original description of development. Another key limit on what section 73 can, can do, it, it cannot extend the time for commencing a development or a deadline for applying for reserved matters. That's subsection five. So again, you might be thinking, why not just go for a full application? And as I say, Annika may return um, to, to, to uh, some of the political and practical reasons uh, for doing uh, section 73 applications, but just a handful of quick points that come out of the legislative scheme. Application fees for Section 73 applications are much lower. Uh, the general requirements for applications are less onerous. Uh, there's no requirement for a design and access statement and there are reduced consultation requirements. So there are, when you take it together with subsection two and that more narrow scope focusing in on uh, the extent to which conditions should be altered, there are good legal reasons that you might want to plump for a section 73 application. As I say, Annika might tell us about some of the practical and political reasons in a moment. And I'll end my quick canter uh, through the statutory scheme with the Lambeth problem, a cautionary tale from the Supreme Court. And it's a cautionary tale which Robert Carnworth, Lord Carnworth, knows very well uh, and may tell us something about later on uh, this evening. Because lots of us talk about Section 73 permissions as variations or as uh, modifications, one can forget their status as freestanding planning permissions. And from time to time, local planning authorities forget that they need to attach not only the freshly minted condition, which prompted the Section 73 application to the new consent, they also need to impose all of the other conditions from the earlier consent or consents um, to the new uh, Section 73 permission. Now, the, the Lambeth case, just in, an, in a nutshell, for those of you who, who, who aren't familiar with it, the story starts with a 1985 planning permission for a DIY store in Streatham, subject to a condition which limited sales to a selection of goods, including DIY, garden improvement goods, that kind of thing. To cut a long story short, in 2014, Lambeth granted a Section 73 permission, which purported to broaden that into the sale and display of non-food goods. Full stop. There was no condition imposed which thought, sought to control that, but that was in a sort of, uh, that was under the description of development heading of the Section 73 consent that Lambeth sought to, uh, to grant. Now, in 2015, the interested party made an application for a certificate of lawfulness to say that the, the unit should be allowed to, to be used for open and unrestricted A1 retail. The basis for that certificate application was that the 2014 permission had no conditions on it, which sought to restrict goods which could be sold from the premises. Earlier conditions had not been reimposed. In the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Lewison said it was clear what Lambeth 
meant to do in a broad sense but he said that's not the question the question is what did they actually do there was not he said the critical condition that they meant to impose but forgot to essentially which sought to, which would have um sought to constrain the goods which could have been sold from this unit he held that read as a whole from the perspective of a reasonable reader the 2014 uh, section 73 permission didn't do what lambeth had thought it did they'd mistakenly allowed a far broader suite of goods to be sold than they thought. But that decision was reversed by Robert Carnworth in the Supreme Court, Lord Carnworth, who's, who will be addressing you uh, in a few minutes' time. And in the end, the difference in approach turned on what a reasonable reader would make of all of this. Lord Carnworth's reasonable reader would take the permission at face value without undue complication and wouldn't have been overly concerned by the absence of a condition limiting the goods which can be sold. Further conditions, Lord Carnworth found on from an earlier 2010 permission, still applied even though they hadn't been expressly reimposed on this brand new Section 73 consent. Now, Lord Carnworth endorsed the wisdom of the advice that it's highly desirable that all conditions to which a new planning permission uh, will be subject should be restated expressly in the new permission and not be left to this process of cross-referencing and historical investigations. But I want to end with just a, a critical health warning. The wise advice, though that may be, it, it is not always followed. Lambeth is a, is a case in point. So if you are trying to uh, formulate or rely on a Section 73 consent, it is now absolutely mission critical, particularly after Lambeth, to evaluate your rights and your obligations with a full understanding of the planning history that might involve some historical digging and even gulp some legal advice. Don't assume that just because old conditions don't reappear on newer consents that they no longer apply. You could find yourself with a Lambeth-sized problem. Uh, with that health warning, um, I'm going to pass it over to Annika, who will be talking to you about some of the practical issues which arise in Section 73 application. So over to you, Annika. Thank you very much, Zach. So we just heard that Finney set the principle that Section 73 only allows us to change conditions. We must leave the description of development intact. So previously our focus when deciding whether a change to development would be consented via Section 73 would have been the Arrowcroft test, would it be a fundamental alteration? We now need to consider this additional step that Zach talked about. Would the change, which must be affected by a change to conditions, render the development inconsistent with the description of development? If it would, and the change is more than non-material, so we can't use Section, 70, Section 96A, then a full planning application is required. Next slide, please. So the problems that this causes are obvious, I think. So I've illustrated on the slide here a fictional description of development. It's pre-2020 because we've got no use class E there. Next slide, please. And now I've highlighted in red the most obvious details of the description of development that might be constraining to the possibility of a section Section 73 application. And below this is a table which sets out whether potential changes would pass the Arrowcroft test and then the additional hurdle set by Finney of no change to the description of development. I won't go through each example in detail, but you can take a brief look and that will tell you that we are much more restricted post Finney in that changes that were previously available to be consented via Section 73 may no longer be able to use that route, depending on whether Zach's trick, uh, 96A amendment trick that he mentioned earlier would work. The smallest changes like the small uplift and retail floor space, in the second row or the new substation in the fourth row may have the 96A route available to them, but we can see that we're much more constrained. Next slide, please. So a few observations on Finney. The obvious trend following this decision will be to try to keep details like heights and floor spaces out of the description of development and leave these to condition. So we're probably going to end up with, and indeed are already ending up with more vague descriptions of development. Use class E might assist with this going forward because it will allow descriptions of development to be more flexibly drafted, but it won't assist already consented developments. And it also is unlikely to assist with physical details in descriptions of development. 
Many local authorities have a preference for very detailed descriptions of development with varying reasons for this. Um, and there's an inconsistency in approach from authority to authority. So Lord Justice Lewis and Infini didn't see the objection to an approach um, that would require changes to be consented more regularly via a full planning permission than a section 73. That touched on the practical implications in terms of time and cost of seeking a fresh planning permission as opposed to a section 73. And I think many listening to this will also appreciate that a section 73 application will often be less politically sensitive than a full planning application and therefore provide more certainty to the developer. The reasons for this are multiple, many are determined under delegated powers, so by officers rather than members. Officers will often limit their consideration of the planning merits to a relatively narrow focus, which I'll return to later, um, or instruct members to do so if the application is going um, to committee. And it's less likely to generate a large amount of public campaigning because um, objectors will be aware that, that, that a baseline position has been set. And that all adds up to more certainty for developers. So developers definitely want to use section 73 at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, but unfortunately, Finney is the law of the land at the moment. And you might be thinking, you know, why has the Court of Appeal made my life so difficult? Well, as Zach highlighted in their defence, all they did was read what Section 73 actually says. And what it says is on the next slide. And that is you can make an application for planning permission without complying with conditions subject to which a previous planning permission was granted. And on the next side, we can see what it doesn't say, which is the word minor, the word material, or the word amendment. It doesn't actually say the word amendment anywhere. So what Finney did was expose, I think, in quite a high profile way, that section 73 isn't the benevolent workhorse of the planning system that we all thought it was. But the warning signs have already, always been there. They're on the slide at the moment. And on if you go to the next slide, we'll be able to see some words that have that cause us the troubles that we're in today, which is that the planning authority will only consider the question of the conditions to which the permission is subject when they consider a section 73 application. That's what caused the problem in Finney. If the authority do decide that some variation of conditions is acceptable, a new alternative permission will be created. And then it is then open to the applicant to decide whether to implement that new permission or the old one. So it's this concept, the concept of a new permission created by section 73 that sits alongside old permissions causes huge practical difficulties. So I'll go into some practical examples. And the first one is on the next slide. So amending the wrong permission, this is very, very common. So let me paint a scenario. Landlord markets a thousand square foot retail unit to a tenant. The information memorandum says the planning permission for that floor space was granted as part of a wider mixed use development. Buyers lawyers get appointed. We take a look. This is what we find. So you can see that in 2016, planning permission was granted for 85 residential units and flexible commercial floor space across five buildings. In that same year, two Section 96As were granted amending that May 2016 permission, one for a new substation and one to increase the ground floor retail unit size to 1,000 square feet, so the unit that we're trying to let now. Then in May 2018, a new Section 73 was granted that added five residential units. And we know that this is a brand new permission in law and that the amendments made via section 96A to the 2016 permission don't automatically carry forward. Um, and then we can see that there's an, another section 96A that amends the May 2018 permission to introduce a new on-site energy source. Then we have another section 96A, again in law, a fresh permission in 2019. So ultimately, the 2019 permission is marketed by the landlord, but if you came to do proper due diligence, you would realise that several aspects of what they thought was the consented scheme, so the five additional residential units, the substation, the larger retail unit, the new energy source, don't actually have consent because when each section 73 was granted, there was not a check to make sure that the plans on the, on the relevant condition actually incorporated the development that had been consented so far. 
So the practical fix for this is actually quite easy, and that's to ensure that every time a Section 73 is granted, a very careful check is carried out to make sure that the condition that requires compliance with plans and which should list the plans includes a correct and up-to-date list of the consented scheme. Um, and do also ensure, it, it seems like an obvious point, but that you do include a condition that lists plans. So this preserves the possibility of using Section 73 to make variations to design. Because remember from our previous slide, you can only use Section 73 when there is a condition to vary. So on the next slide is a variation of this theme and it's implementing the wrong permission. This also happens. Um, very often the works that are carried out to affect a material operation are not particularly specific to any Section 73. So it might be demolition of the existing building. And it's not always clear which se Section 73 has been implemented. And that can cause uncertainty. And in our scenario here, if a solicitor came along in 2020 to investigate this fact pattern, they would discover that only the February 2019 permission was implemented. And we, but we know from earlier that none of the previous changes were brought forward, but now the time limit condition has expired. So they've actually lost the ability to build out any of those changes. Um, so to avoid a situation where you don't know the sec which section 73 has been implemented, again, is really quite easy to, to remedy. A clear letter to the planning authority with a reference to which permission has been implemented. The planning reference number evidence of the material operation will make things clear in the future. And of course, the mitigating um, factors that I talk about earlier in terms of making sure that each consent incorporates all the changes previously made. Next slide, please. Um, discharging conditions. So Zach talked about this. I'll just return to it really briefly. Um, this is our Lambeth problem. So two related issues, imposing conditions on the new Section 73 consent, how to recognise conditions that have been discharged under the previous Section 73 consent. Because a Section 73 is in law of fresh planning permission, what really should happen is that conditions that attach to the, the conditions for the new consent should be freshly set out in relation to each decision notice um, stated in full with necessary changes to reflect obviously the variation being applied for but also conditions that have been previously discharged or satisfied. Another really tricky question is what about where conditions have already been discharged under a previous consent but the, the relevant condition wording hasn't been changed on the new consent. So, it, so for example, if a condition required this, uh, a submission for of a drainage strategy for approval, um, that had been submitted and approved, but the new uh, section 73 reimposed that condition, can you read that across? It's a difficult issue. Um, I think usually most people will be happy with a, an email from the planning authority confirming what they think the position is, um, but it's much better to, to check the section 73 draft decision notice and rectify it before it comes an issue. Um, and next slide. The final issue I'm going to discuss, I think is the most difficult one and Zach touched on it earlier. It concerns the extent to which an updated development plan or new material considerations are required to be considered in relation to a Section 73. So we know that an application for planning permission must be determined in accordance with a development plan unless any material considerations indicate otherwise, so 38.6. We also know that an application under Section 73 is an application for planning permission. So we can see that an application for Section 73 needs to be determined in accordance with the up-to-date development plan and material considerations, but how much of the application would be under consideration afresh by the planning authority? Is it just the change being made or is it the full development? On the next slide, we can see the legal principle comes from the judgment of Justice Sullivan, as he then was in Pi, which is the case Zach mentioned earlier. And a local planning authority's consideration of a Section 73 application is a more limited exercise than the consideration of the full application, but how much more limited depends on the nature of the conditions that are subject to the Section 73 application. So the passage on the slide, which is from Pi, gives an example of quite an easy scenario where the scope for consideration will be quite obviously narrow. So if you're 
if your application is for a change to an hours condition or a change to external materials, there is a very narrow area in focus. The updated development plan should be considered in relation to those narrow areas, but the authority doesn't need to extend its consideration beyond that. But we all know that Section 73 applications are often much more wide ranging than that, and they can introduce new uses and impacts that warrant a wider consideration. And on the next slide, on that question, unfortunately, PI doesn't offer us very much help. And the reason is, is that in PI, the court held that the local planning authority in that case was right to reconsider the full planning merits of a development when determining a Section 73 application. But that's because the application in that case was for the extension of a time limit. So it was before the law came into effect that, Jack, that Zach talked about, which prohibits extending a time limit through Section 73. So the practical effect of that application was quite profound because it allowed a development to proceed that wouldn't have otherwise been able to proceed. Um, and that was the case that they were deciding there, but they don't actually give us any guidance on what we do where we've got changes that are quite significant, but fall short of a kind of full, uh, the full consideration that was, that was, they had there. So the situation we're left with is that there's no guiding principle where changes are made via Section 73 applications, which have significant practical consequences. And the judgment in PI essentially says it depends on the facts. Um, that leaves us in quite an unsatisfactory position with a lot of developers seeking case-by-case -case legal advice. Um, and there's quite a lot of uncertainty. And the next slide is the final slide. So I've provided a quick overview of some of the issues with Section 73 as it stands. It's not all of them, and I haven't even touched on EIA or the issues with Section 106, but we need to dedicate some time to thinking about how this might all be fixed. And with that, I'll hand over to Matthew White, my colleague. Thank you very much, Annika, and good evening, everybody. Um, despite what this uh, first slide suggests, I'm not actually a Crystal Palace fan, um, but I am a fan of words, and I like bounce back ability. And if we move to the next slide, um, this is Ian Dowie, who's the former manager of Crystal Palace Football Club. And bounce back ability is a word that he invented to describe the essential qualities possessed by Crystal Palace that led them to winning promotion to the Premiership in 2004. And I think it's also the perfect word to describe what the planning system needs to help us recover from the pandemic. Next slide, please. And why do I say that? Well, we recently carried out uh, a research project at Herbert Smith Freehills on the future of cities. And it showed that business leaders are already looking beyond the pandemic. 80% see factors other than COVID-19 as the greatest uncertainty facing their projects. And 74% said that their projects have had to become more adaptable to change. But many pre-pandemic planning permissions are now unviable or undeliverable. So there is a real immediate need to uh, win, easy win planning reforms that will increase flexibility and help us to bounce back. And I think a new specific power to amend planning permissions, which doesn't suffer from the problems outlined by Zach and Annika, would really help to unlock some of these projects. But it would need primary legislation. So I'm gonna review the issues that the legislation would need to address. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So what sort of application am I talking about? Well, it would be an application that would result in a variation of the existing planning permission, like section 96A, not one that would lead to a new planning permission being granted, like section 73, but it wouldn't be limited to non-material amendments. It would be broader than that. Now, if it, if it varies the existing planning permission, that means that the process would be permanent once varied, you can't choose whether to implement the original or the varied permission. Only the varied permission would be available. But it avoids some of the confusion that Annika has talked about with multiple permissions for the same site and would also have the benefit of providing certainty to the public as to what the development on the site will actually be. And I think um, this sort of application should be defined as a planning application for the purposes of the Act and Section 336 definition. And that would mean that the standard notification of publicity requirements for applications would apply. It would also mean that refusals could be appealed. 
in London, the applications would be subject to the mayor's planning powers. It could even be called in by the Secretary of State. Let's move on to the next slide. So should the scope of the power be limited? Well, unlike section 73, I think it should allow changes to conditions, the description of development, or any of the matters um, approved by the planning commission, including the approved plans. So a very broad power, but I think there has to be some limit on the extent of changes that can be made. And there comes a point where an amendment is so extensive or fundamental that in reality, it is actually proposing a completely new development. And it's impossible to say categorically where that point is reached. It will depend on the circumstances of the development uh, and the nature and scale uh, of the amendment proposed. So it's a classic question of fact and degree in every case, but that's a good thing. And there are plenty of formulations in case law of what that test should be. Personally, I like the test that Lord Keith adopted in the Inverclyde case of whether the amendment would have the effect of altering the whole character of the application so as to amount in substance to a new application, but there are variations on that throughout case law. Next slide, please. So how should these new category of applications be determined by planning authorities? Well, I think primarily by reference to the development plan. The section 38, subsection six duty should apply, subject to material considerations, including national and local planning policies and guidance. And it follows that the presumption in favor of sustainable development would also apply. Logically though, as Annika has outlined, planning policies should only be applied to the change that is being made and not to the whole development. And the authority should have the power to vary any existing planning conditions or to impose new planning conditions where necessary in accordance with the standard tests. Similarly, they could require new or modified planning obligations where necessary to make the amendment um, acceptable and the development acceptable in planning terms. And of course, SIL would also need to be recalculated for the amended development. Next slide, please. So do we think that you ought to be able to apply if the existing planning permission has already lapsed? Well, I don't think so. Uh, the power that I'm talking about, I think should be capable, um, should not be capable of bringing a, a permission back to life in effect. A permission that can no longer be implemented cannot be amended because there's nothing valid to amend. And similarly, in line with the restriction in England in section 73, subsection five, these new applications should not be used to extend the time limit for implementation or for the grant of approval of reserve matters. Now, the question of whether that ought to be allowed, I think is for another time. But if it is, in my opinion, there should be a separate procedure for a renewal application instead. Next slide, please. So when do I think you should be able to apply? Well, I think it ought to be permissible to apply, certainly before the development has begun, and also while it is underway. Um, many of you uh, tuned in to this webinar will, I'm sure, remember that before we had non-material and minor material amendments, Westminster City Council, and I'm sure many other authorities, used to have a category of application called changes in the course of construction. And these were treated by Westminster as new planning applications but were used to authorize amendments to developments after they had begun. And it was very flexible, it worked flawlessly, it had absolutely no basis in statute whatsoever though. Um, and essentially that's really what I'm trying to recreate now. I think I'd draw the line at amending permissions once the development has been completed uh, and the case you see there at the bottom of the slide, Sign and Valley, um, held that once the planning permission is spent, the development is completed, um, it, there's nothing left to do. So it, it, it's spent once completed. And allowing amendments after the development is complete would effectively be allowing new development. And that doesn't seem right. A new planning application should in those circumstances uh, be submitted. Or you have section 73A to grant retrospective planning permission. Um, one exception might, however, be to allow amendments to continuing planning conditions that control the operational phase of the development. And I noticed that Kim Lewison in the Fulford case appeared to contemplate the use of section 96A applications to formalize minor differences between approved layout plans and the as-built development. So perhaps the new power does not have to be drawn quite so tightly as I have suggested. Next slide. Uh, what about reserve matters? Um, and in fact, I've seen some questions on this in the Q&A. 
Um, should the new power extend to amending reserve matters? I think so, yes. Um, in Fulford, the Court of Appeal uh, confirmed uh, a couple of years ago that Section 96A could be used to amend reserve matters approvals if the amendments were non-material. And adopting the same logic as the court uh, applied in that case, it would make no sense for a local planning authority to have the power to make changes to matters approved in a, uh, in a full planning permission, but not to matters that had been reserved by an outline and then subsequently approved through reserve matters. Next slide, please. Should you be able to apply for an amendment that only relates to part of the development or part of the site approved by the original permission? Um, yes, absolutely. This is, <coughs> excuse me, this is one of the most difficult questions in relation to amendments, but it's also one of the most important. So where the ownership of a large development site has been fragmented, the owner of part of the site must be free to amend the development authorized for his or her land without having to rely on the other landowners approving or even participating in the application. And I think unlike applications for planning permission, the applicant must have a land interest in the land in question. But as with section 96A, it should be possible to submit an application that only relates to the development on the land within the applicant's ownership. And other landowners with an interest in that part of the site should be notified of the application, but it shouldn't be necessary to notify the owners of any other part of the development that is not being amended. This keeps the power flexible, agile, and very usable. Now, clearly applications will need to include a red line plan, but it only needs to identify the land on which the amended development will be located. And of course, any amended conditions will need to make clear which land they apply to. Next slide, please. What about EIA? Well. Where the original development was EIA development under Schedule 1 or Schedule 2, um, then any change to or extension of the development will itself be EIA development, where that change or extension meets the relevant thresholds or descriptions in the schedules. Where the amendments involve new or different significant environmental effects, then EIA should be carried out in order to give the authority the necessary information to decide whether mitigation is required. And this assessment could be carried out by the applicant in a supplementary addendum to the original ES, which would avoid duplicating work that's already been carried out. Where the original development was not EIA development, it is possible that the amendments could take the development into EIA territory. And in that case, the whole development would need to be assessed. And I can see that that would give rise to difficulties where it is only part of the development that is being amended, because in principle, at least, it's the entire project that has to be assessed under EIA case law. Next slide, please. Do we still need, if we introduce this new power, section 96A and section 73? Yes, I think so. They still have a place in the planning code, but doing this would allow section 73 to return to its original purpose of simply amending planning conditions. Next slide, please. And how will we manage complex permissions that might be amended multiple times by multiple parties? Well, because there's only ever going to be one permission, this ought to be easier than at present, where you have numerous section 73s and sometimes slot ins and slot outs relating to the same site. But that management would be helped enormously by digitalization. So just as the planning white paper proposes that local plans should be fully digitized and web based, so should planning registers. And this would enable planning permissions to be accessed via maps and for updates to be published as soon as permissions are amended. Next slide, please. What next? Well, I certainly think it would be worth preparing a rough draft of the legislation to show how this might work in practice. And I'm conscious uh, there are a million issues I'm sure I haven't touched on, but I'm willing to have a go. And then I might put it on LinkedIn or something to see if my efforts can be improved by the wider planning community and by, by many of you today. And you, know, you never know, it might just grab the government's attention as a, as a good way to bounce back. So with that, I will hand back to Neil. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, we've heard from the practitioners and now it's time to hear from a judicial perspective. So I'm going to hand over to Bill Carmworth. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm sort of here in a slightly odd capacity, uh, 
for, for having for the last 25 years I've been deciding cases so it's a novel idea to be taking part in something which is looking at how to advise people um, and I'm grateful for Landmark allowing me to come on um, in my new capacity as an associate of Landmark Chambers um, and I was particularly interested to do so because I was responsible for the leading judgment in one of the cases they're considering and it's quite salutary for me to have to listen to people working out the practical consequences of that and in fact I think the landmark case uh, I mean sorry the Lambeth case is relatively um, uncontentious I mean there were differences about it but it was an odd odd decision odd permission because it was just very badly drafted and they hadn't taken account of the advice in the circular but by the time it got to us no one was actually challenging its validity um, there might well have been a good case for a local resident to have um, challenged its validity but by the time it got to us it's really a battle between the developer or the landowner and the local authority as to what it meant and um, we were able to say that actually it meant what I think obviously Lambeth had intended it to mean um, that it was subject to the restrictions uh, the point which was touched on a moment ago about the uh, whether the conditions in the previous condition were carried forward um, again that only arose because th that whoever was dealing with it hadn't looked at the advice in the circular but we were able to say it wasn't actually a matter of decision uh, that um, as the original permission had been implemented with the conditions then unless what had followed or the new permission was inconsistent with those conditions then they should carry forward but that was a very special case I think the Finney case is much more important in general terms and I can see exactly why the Court of Appeal reached the decision they did which as Anika said was a very much straightforward of interpretation of what the words said and I understand that permission was applied for but not granted by the Supreme Court that was after my time but um, I, I did looking back at it it did seem to be quite a, a hard luck on the developers whatever you think about that particular form of development because they had got their permission for a hundred meter tall turbine they um, or apparently advised you can see this from the high court decision they were advised by the local authority that section 73 was the way to go forward and they did that in good faith and I think probably on the basis of the Arukov decision that was a perfectly sensible approach um, and Mr Finney was a, a resident who objected there was a, a considered uh, uh, the, the authority in fact refused permission but it was went to appeal and the inspector granted permission um, after a very careful consideration um, of the issues um, and no one took the point that the application had been invalid from the start and that only came up when the case came to the high court um, and the other thing that struck me about it was uh, I'm not sure the issues would have been any different if um, uh, it had been a new application because even then the, the inspector would have been looking at it on the basis that there was already a valid permission for a hundred meter tall development and so again exactly the same question would have been well does this make a material difference so I thought it was, it was slightly hard luck but there we are they can probably look after that um, I think it does the result of it all as has been outlined by the speakers is a rather unsatisfactory um, position where one sort of trying being told to use a sort of combination of section 96a and section 73 um, and um, I must say I see considerable merit in the idea of um, some sort of amended statutory provision to try and deal with this um, I mean the only other point I would make is that in the context of the government's a proposed white paper reforms um, I was quite critical of those in an earlier um, landmark webinar 
on the basis that they were proposing sort of fundamental reform when we don't need fundamental reform. But I think if they were to concentrate much more on these sort of uh, practical problems, um, of which there no doubt are others, that would be a, a very useful exercise. And I hope that that's something which can be looked at. But I don't want to stand in the way of questions. So I'll now stop and li enjoy listening further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to all our excellent speakers. Uh, we're now moving on to uh, questions and answers. Just before we turn to that, if anybody's got burning questions about overlapping planning permissions, Pilkington and Hillside, uh, save them up because we are going to run another similar webinar on the 10th of March. So everybody who's interested in Hillside, 10th of March, um, same format. But let's um, move on to some questions. And can I, we had a whole range of questions, but can I start with one, which is about multiple section 73 applications and section 73 permissions. Um, and although Finney has come in for a degree of criticism, um, I suppose I'm going to turn this question slightly around and say, does Finney help uh, when one's considering multiple uh, Section 73 permissions? Matthew, can I turn to you on this first, please, and then invite others to join in? Yeah, so I think the interesting thing about Section 73 is that it only ever amends the most recent planning permission or the one that you choose to amend. So in that sense, if you have multiple Section 73 consents, um, there is no limit on that because um, you're only ever making a change from the one that's being applied for. So I don't think there is a restriction under the legislation. There's not a provision uh, like Section 96A subsection 2 that says you take into account the previous changes that have been made to decide whether something is non-material or not. And as has been pointed out, Section 73 itself doesn't refer to minor material amendments in any case. You're simply applying for a new permission with different conditions on it. So I think, you know, th there's nothing in the legislation. Um, I'm not sure Finney does provide a check on this, but um, Neil, you, you may be able to come up with something that, uh, that corrects that. <laughs> well, what I had in mind is that you can, there's a danger of getting permission creep with Section 73. You make a number of incremental changes. Whereas if you've got to stick to the description of development, yes. you, to a certain extent, um, prevent that permission creep. But uh, I welcome the views of others. Do others have a, a view on this issue? I think that's probably right, because I think, as was demonstrated by my table, I think there's not that many cases where Finney would be less stringent than Arrowcroft. I can't. I can't really think of a. I can't really think of a circumstance that that's the, that that's the case. And you're absolutely right. You can fundamental alteration is kind of assessed in, in the rounds, isn't it? Because you say you can't have section 73s or 96As that creep towards a position, and then suddenly um, you, there there will come a point that you've breached that threshold. So I I think that's right. I don't think that's that that is. Um, a particular advantage of Finney, though, I think it's just it's something that happened. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, I, I second what Annika and indeed what Matthew have, have said. Um, and I, again, it doesn't really matter what I think now because the, the Court of Appeal have told us what the law is and that's what we're here to try and explain. But for what it's worth, I'm a, I'm a Narrowcroft fan at the end of the day. Um, I, I successfully argued for the Arrowcroft approach uh, um, before Mr Justice Singh, as he was then in a case called Wet, Wet Finishing Works. And that case was about a house builder increasing the number of homes from 84 in the original consent up to 90. And the point was, in that in that case, we were saying, you know, all right, it's an increase. It's inconsistent with the description of development, but it clearly doesn't represent a, quote, fundamental change to the scheme. Per, so perfectly lawful, we were saying. The judge accepted that, but, but Wet Finishing Works was doubted and indeed has been partially overturned now by 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 Finney and Finney represents the law but I must say it seems to me that the Arrowcroft style approach of allowing an element of discretion and judgment for local authorities uh, is a more sensible practical and 
efficient way to design a planning system. However, that's not to say that Finney was wrongly decided. If anything, it probably points towards the need for reform of the sort that Matthew was talking about uh, earlier on. Should we move on to one of the other uh, issues which is raised, which um, is how do you deal with conditions which have already been, to use the jargon, um, discharged? details have been submitted and approved by the local authority and the development's been carried out. Uh, do you need to repeat those? How do you deal with it? Um, and Annika, can I turn to you on that please to start? Yeah, sure. So uh, the guidance is quite clear on this, which is that, as I mentioned, the, the conditions should all be reimposed but what that means isn't that they're reimposed afresh so you need to re-discharge every condition what you can do is you can convert it to a compliance condition so a condition that previously said prior to commencement of development you will submit a drainage strategy for approval will instead say in carrying out the development you must comply with the drainage strategy approved on x date and that's the sensible way to do it that's the clear way to do it and that's supported by um, planning guidance and i think that's what all local authorities should be doing and to the extent that developers want to clarify the position they should help out uh, local authority planning officers i think you have a lot of work and you can always propose draft conditions so collect all the information in one place and actually submit draft conditions for them to check um, and make life easy for them i would say is, is how to get ahead of that problem well, i'm afraid to say it doesn't often happen and we we rarely encounter such a sort of paragon of perfection. And um, that's why Lambeth has caused us all so, ma so many difficulties because that process isn't followed. And it's really tough now to work out sometimes what the permission is. Thank you, anything, anybody, any other views on that issue? Um, well, can we then turn to the, which some have raised, this whole, we've got a new use classes order uh, we've got Class E now, which has replaced a whole series of other classes, um, but we're going to have lots of planning permissions where Class B1C, for example, is referred to in the description of development. Um, if you want to do something about it because you're rather attracted by the idea of um, the Class E flexibility, but you don't want to start off by implementing it um, and implementing a B1C use, uh, what do you do about it? Zach, one for you, I think. That's a nice, easy one to finish on, isn't it? Um, well, <laughs> for, for all the talk of the white paper, for, for my money, Class E is the most radical deregulatory step that the planning system in this country has taken for many, many years. And that's because lots of the white paper ideas could be radical, but still a consultation, lots of the detailers, a lot of us know are to, to be decided and even with a fair wind it's a few where a few years away from being fully implemented and really the target of the white paper is more about changing the way the planning system works which is obviously very important stuff but class e is more fundamental i think because it changes the scope of what town planning is actually about in this country by taking changes of use between a whole range of town center uses outside the scope of development control altogether and we've already got it it's already started it's already happening but and this is the the key point i think class e does not prevent local authorities from seeking to control subsets of uses within that very broad class by condition. Indeed, let's be honest, conditions are more or less all they've got left in their depleting armory um, of tools to regulate variations between these uses, which otherwise, would, as I've said, would fall out outside the scope of development control altogether on the face of it. That, that's the effect of, of Class E. So how does Section 73 or Section 96A play into all of this? It depends, I think. It depends on the site. It depends on the conditions, the way they're drafted. Um, it depends on the policy framework. It may well be that there are particular considerations in, in a the given plan or in the, in the area which make it really important, say, for a particular unit to be retained for retail rather than for officers or a restaurant or vice versa or, you know, back again. So I, I don't think it follows just from the fact of Class E that a condition 
which requires use to be, say, for retail only or whatever it is, no longer serves a useful planning purpose. And so ergo, it would follow its, you know, its immaterial to shift it to something else. It, it would depend. And we'd be back to a sort of case by case assessment for local planning officers. But to come back to one of the parts of your question, Neil, was clearly if what we need to do is alter the description of development, if that's what we need to do in order to make this work, then we're back to Finney and the problem that's identified there. And we'd, we'd need either a new application or we'd need to try and alter that description of development um, by use of 96A. Can I just add to that very quickly, because I appreciate we're running out of time. This is a real issue at the moment as a result of the pandemic. So there are people out there with unimplemented permissions that include, say, leisure uses. That leisure use of cinema or something, let's say, is included in the description of development. You can't apply for a change of use because the use hasn't been instituted. Um, and we, it would be really helpful uh, if we had a power to apply for change of use before the use is instituted given that if it's in the description of development, you can't use a minor material, you can't use a non-material, and you are faced with a really difficult position of section 73 or a new planning application, which is crazy. So I think we've probably got time for one more, and there's a interesting issue that's been raised by somebody. Um, we're not allowed to credit uh, people who ask questions with their names because we're told we're not allowed to do that for GPDR, so apologies. I think it's an interesting question. I think we start with you, Matthew, and I'd be interested also in Robert Carnworth's views on this as the uh, author of the early report on enforcement. What are the consequences for enforcement if you introduce new flexibility? Do you have to then, uh, and I'm now speculating, do you then have to introduce, in addition to a ground A appeal, a ground something else appeal, which says, well, if we'd applied for um, a flexible change, uh, we would have got that. So, Matthew, how would that fit in with your proposals? Does it change things dramatically, though? I mean, what we're talking about here is a, is a new class of planning application to vary an existing consent. And the judgment as to whether that would or would not be acceptable is determined by reference to the same things, the same legal principles and planning policies as a new application would be. So if you define this type of application as a planning application, it seems to me you're applying the same judgment, even though it's a variation rather than a new permission. Maybe that's an overly simplistic way of looking at it, but in principle, yes, I think you should be allowed to say, I would receive planning permission for this if I were to apply for it, regardless of whether that's a new application or a variation of the existing. Yes, well, if you wanted me to comment, uh, Neil, um, I, I wrote my report on enforcement in 1989, so things may have moved on a little since then. But I mean, I, as uh, Matthew said, I can't see really why in principle a ground A appeal shouldn't cover this this sort of thing. I don't know whether it does still, but I mean, certainly in principle it should. So I don't, I wouldn't see that as a serious problem. And I think it, if it didn't, it could be extended so that it did. Mm. Um, well, I think we have got to time, unless anybody's dying to make another uh, contribution or a comment. Nobody pushing themselves forward. Uh, can I thank all our speakers um, for their excellent talks? Uh, and for stimulating this discussion. And I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion on the 10th of March, when we turn to the uh, tricky issue of overlapping planning permissions, uh, Hillside and Pilkington. So thank you very much, everybody who joined. Uh, goodbye.